Okay, fantastic. So we're going to start. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Louisa Brownell. I'm one of the UCT registrars. This morning, I thought that I talked to us about um, a little bit about neurofibromatosis. Um, it's not something that we see that often, but from an ENT perspective, um, it is important to know about. Um, and especially, you know, there are some uh, imaging characteristics and some management principles. Um, and also just to look out for, it's not a condition that's managed um, by, you know, the, this type of condition from an ENT perspective is usually managed by very specialized units, um, but it's always good to, to challenge ourselves and, and go through topics again. So neurofibromatosis is a neurocutaneous genetic disorder, and really it isn't a single disorder. It actually refers to three different conditions. And these three different conditions, um, in essence, they involve development of tumors throughout skin and the central nervous system. These tumors are usually benign, um, sometimes, and really they may have malignant potential. The three types that we talk about when we talk about neurofibromatosis is neurofibromatosis type one, type two, and schwannomatosis. Type one is also known as von Ringklenhausen disease. And that um, neurofibromatosis type one is by far the majority of your cases. So 96% of neurofibromatosis cases will be a type one. And they characterize largely by neurofibromas, the typical cafe au lait spots, um, axillary freckling, and of course, optic gliomas. Neurofibromatosis type two is the type that we are far more likely to see as otolaryngologists but they are more rare than the NF type one at around 3% of cases. And what we may see here is bilateral vestibular schwannomas um, and related sequelae, and also even possibly meningiomas. And then the third type is what we call schwannomatosis. And this third type really is a mimicker of NF2. It is the rarest form and it mimics NF2 because it also presents with schwannomas. In schwannomatosis, you can actually have a third of the tumors that are limited to a single part of the body, for example, an arm or a leg, or perhaps even the back. First, we'll have a look at neurofibromatosis type one. Um, in NF1, as we said, it forms about 96% of neurofibromatosis cases. It is rare, it only presents in about one in 3,000 births with an equal male to female distribution. Um, but it is the most common autosomal gene disorder of the nervous system. There have been more than 500 genetic mutations identified in NF1. Um, and of these mutations, around 50% can actually be spontaneous mutations, with the other half being inherited. They have variable expressivity, um, and all our organ systems can be affected. And the gene responsible in NF1 is a gene called neurofibromin, and in essence, it codes for protein. Um, NF1 develops due to a loss of a functional mutation, and as we said, this can either be a spontaneous genetic mutation or it can be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. The chromosome that it's located on is chromosome 17, and that's quite important to know because that's very different from NF2, which is located on chromosome 22. Neurofibromin um, uh, is a tumor suppressor gene and it's involved in various pathways. When we look at NF1, you can also get mosaicism. Mosaicism is in essence where there's not as a root expression of the disease, but it's sub subdivided into three types, segmental, generalized, and gonadal, each um, with its own type of presentation. Segmental can be limited to one or more body segments, as we mentioned before. The generalized one can be kind of similar to NF1, but it doesn't really have the full NF1 gene mutation. And the gonadal one only actually affects ova or sperm. So the clinical presentation of NF1 is very well described. And if you look on the internet, you will see many, 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 many images of various presentations of NF1. It can present with cutaneous and non-cutaneous lesions. The hallmark of this really is the cafe au lait spots, which are usually present um, at birth, as you can see in the top left image. They can also present with cutaneous and subcutaneous neurofibromas, 
that tends to happen a little bit later in childhood, and that's demonstrated by the top right image. And then thirdly, they can present with plexiform neurofibromas, and that can happen into, in about half of NF1 patients. So that's kind of demonstrated by the picture of the little girl in the bottom right. Um, so plexiform neurofibromas are also described as a bag of worms. They're similar to neurofibromas, but they actually arrive from muscle nerve sheets, and they can infiltrate structures. They usually present at birth, and they like to present in the head and neck, um, paraspinal, or even other extremities. If you look on the internet, this image is what you will often come across. I think it's a very good description of neurofibromatosis type 1 and all the different um, possibilities that these um, patients and often children can present with. So you can see they can present with learning dis disabilities. They can have a larger than normal size head. They present with leash nodules. It's important to know that leash nodules don't affect your vision. Whereas the optic gliomas, which they can present with, can affect your vision. They can have overall short stature. Um, we've already mentioned the neurofibromas. They can have scoliosis. They can have groin freckling and limb deformities. Um, and they even can have pe pectus excavatum. Um, in neurofibromatosis, you do have an increased risk for other uh, malignant, uh, malignant pathologies, such as rhabdomyosarcoma, myeloid leukemia, and even pheochromocytomas. Um, the cutaneous uh, component of neurofibromatosis type 1 can also just be generalized hyperpigmentation, um, melanomas, um, and other things such as seizures and cardiovascular complications. So there are very specific diagnostic criteria for both NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. For NF1, you need two of the following seven must be met. Genetic testing is not routinely done as part of the diagnostic criteria, but the space is a space that is rapidly developing, and we may see a change in the next couple of years. Um, in essence, the diagnostic criteria, you need six or more cafe lay spots, and there's a specific measurement, whether it's pre-pubital or post-pubital. You need two or more neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, as demonstrated by B. Um, auxiliary or groin freckling, optic glioma, which you've mentioned, two or more leash nodules, sphenoidal dysplasia or thinning of long bone cortex, and then a first degree relative with NF1. How do we treat NF1? Well, surgery still is the primary treatment, but surgery is often incomplete. So in this space, there's a large room for drug and also genetic treatments, which is an ongoing, um, ongoing studies and ongoing course of investigations. Cafe lay spots and neurofibromas really don't need to be treated. We only surgically excise them if they become symptomatic, for example, if they present with pain, and we know that recurrence can occur. Your plexiform neurofibromas, these have about, on average, about a 10% malignant potential, and you would suspect that perhaps the plexiform neurofibromas um, have had malignant transformation if they have rapid growth, um, if they have pain, any new neurology, or change in the consistency of the bag of the worms. The treatment for these can be wide local excision, and then there are other um, agents which have been shown to decrease their size, such as imatinib. The third type of um, NF of neurofibromatosis we mentioned was schwannomatosis. I've decided to discuss this here because the bulk of our discussion will actually run around NF2. So we're going to discuss this one um, prior to doing NF2. Uh, schwannomatosis is called a mimicker of NF2. Um, it's likely an attenuated form of NF2. Um, and the reason it mimics it is because it also presents with schwannomas, um, much more commonly than meningiomas. It's caused by mutations or deletions on these two genes, and they are also located on chromosome 22, which is also the chromosome um, on which NF2 pathology is located. And the thing about schwannomatosis is that they only really present in the third decade, which is very different to NF1, where you can actually present um, early on in childhood. They can present with a pain or mass, even both. Um, but what's interesting about them is that although they present mostly with schwannomas, they present less commonly with vestibular schwannomas. They usually present with schwannomas located elsewhere in the body, for example, your spine or other peripheral nerves. If you have a patient with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, that obviously rather favors um, neurofibromatosis type 2 rather than a diagnosis of schwannomatosis. Schwannomatosis can be familial, can also be sporadic. 
Um, and it's genetically different from NF1 and NF2, although the signs may clinically overlap NF2. In essence, um, there's a loss of function on your SMARC-B1 gene, and that's important for intracellular remodeling. How we would treat this, again, surgery remains our primary management, and that is really symptom orientated to relieve pain or decompress, um, and also recurrence is also common. With regards to radiotherapy, the only role for radiotherapy is really in life-threatening tumors due to the location of where they are, and in cases that are not amenable to surgery. Um, from a medical management perspective, there's very limited data, but it does appear that avastin is also um, a worthwhile drug looking at in schwannomatosis. There can be a concern for malignant transformation, but again, there's limited data, and there are no current trials for this population. So um, I think this is a space that we can watch um, for upcoming developments. The diagnostic criteria for schwannomatosis is divided into def definite and possible, definite being um, an age group above 30, and two or more non-intradermal schwannomas, um, one having histological confirmation, and no evidence of vestibular schwannoma on an MRI, and also no known NF2 mutation, or one pathologically confirmed non-vestibular um, schwannoma, plus a first degree relative who will, be, who will meet the above criteria. There's also um, the classification of possible schwannomatosis, um, which in essence, the big differences there are the age um, distribution. You can see less than 30 years and more than 45 years is indicated in purple. And then also some other, um, some other radiographic evidence of non vestibular schwannoma and first degree relatives. Okay, now we come to neurofibromatosis type two. As we said before, this, this is likely what we're going to see um, as ENTs and it, it's much more rare than NF1, presents about 3% of cases, and typically they present um, with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, but we'll debug that a little bit more. Um, they can also present with meningiomas. Um, they present in about 1 to 33,000, up until about 87,000 births. Um, in the UK, they say that it's around 60,000, 60, 1 in 60,000 births. Um, with no male or female um, preference, uh, equal, equal representation in, in both genders. Um, and they can have variable presentations amongst families. Neurofibromatosis, it's a genetic disease. So 50% can arrive de novo and the other 50% may be familial. Mostly they present with schwannomas and meningiomas and they can have many tumors um, throughout the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. Um, and with NF2, it is quite important to try and differentiate it from sporadic vestibular schwannoma. In NF2, um, in children under five years, they sort of really present, but it's generally accepted that by the age of 40, almost all patients with NF2 will at least have some symptoms. 50% of your cases can be new mutations, so your family history often might be negative. There is um, a severe clinical presentation form when you actually have a truncated protein mutation, which is basically just a very abnormal protein mutation. Um, and they, they present with a lot more clinically severe um, um, signs and symptoms, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And at this point, I thought it might be useful just to look at some differences between NF2 and NF1 in terms of features. NF2 is a lot less, has a lot less cutaneous manifestations doesn't mean it doesn't have any cutaneous manifestations, but it's a lot less if you compare it to NF1. So it makes it tricky because there's a lot less external clues than when you're seeing a patient with NF1. NF2 doesn't have cognitive impairment. Um, NF2 and NF1 have genetically differentiated um, features, NF2 being on chromosome 22 and NF1 being on 17. Vestibular genoma is not a feature of NF1. Um, your neurofibro neurofibromas, your plexiform uh, neurofibromas, and your leash nodules are also not a feature of NF2. So I thought that was quite useful in terms of just trying to um, put both of these conditions in separate boxes. If we look at the genetics of NF2, we said it occurs on chromosome 22. And generally, there's a mutation on one ge genetic allele, and that leads to a loss of function. Um, but you only really develop a tumor when both alleles are involved. That's when they have that second hit. 
So the gene product that codes for um, for the for the protein is in essence, it's Merlin, and it's actually the image in the top right, which looks like lots of ribbons. I thought it was quite a nice picture. Um, and Merlin is really a cell membrane protein in plant cells that's responsible for membrane stabilization and cellular growth. Um, it is a tumor suppressor which play, has roles in various um, pathways. So if you have an absence of this Merlin, you have an increase in your um, EGFR signaling. So you get enhanced angiogenesis and that then lends itself to enhancing uh, tumor growth. In NF2, genetically, it's usually regarded as autosomal dominant, but mosaicism is also possible. Mosaicism being when only some cells have a mutation. And in mosaicism, the chances of the parent transmitting NF2 to the child are lower. Um, lower in, than in comparison if you had a full-blown NF2 um, type genetic um, condition. As we mentioned before, if you have a truncated protein mutation, you can have a lot more clinically severe presentation. So these patients are a lot younger when the disease onset um, occurs. They have a much higher prevalence of tumor. Their tumors are fast growing. They can even have spinal tumors. Um, so you can see a lot more severe. The diagnostic criteria for NF2 is quite important. Um, so definitive NF2 is if you have bilateral vestibular schwannomas. That's the first, first component. Or you could have a first degree relative with confirmed NF2 plus a unilateral vestibular schwannoma in under 30 years. Or third component could be that you could have any two of the following, meningioma, glioma, schwannomas, um, and juvenile cortical cataracts. Then there's obviously the category of the patients that are perhaps not as definitive, and that we call presumptive or probable. And they can have a unilateral vestibular schwannoma in under 30 years, which is why you see that we may need to differentiate them from sporadic vestibular schwannomas. They can have at least one of the above mentioned lesions. They can have two or more meningiomas plus a unilateral vestibular schwannoma, or they can have one of the above mentioned lesions. NF2 testing um, genetically on blood and also on tumor at this point um, does seem to play a role, but it's not part of the um, diagnostic criteria at this point. How do NF2 patients present? Uh, most commonly in your adult population, uh, they're likely to present with hearing loss and obviously sometimes bilaterally. And then um, the other things that are similar to sporadic vestibular schwannoma, like uh, tinnitus, imbalance, facial weakness, and severely um, brain stem compression if the tumors are very large. In children, they're actually more likely to present um, with a cataract as their first lesion. Um, in younger patients, they tend to more commonly have meningiomas rather than vestibular schwannomas. And those can then affect um, your eyes. So they can have ocular manifestations and cataracts. Um, but they can also affect, you know, other cranial nerves can also be involved. Um, most commonly, we have cranial nerve 8 being involved, but it can also result in other cranial nerve causes, depending on the type of lesion um, that presents. The hallmark of vestibular schwannoma really is said to be bilateral vestibular schwannoma. It says, it's said to be pathognomic. Um, but there are just a few things to note with that statement. The first thing is, is that although it is bilaterally, vestibular schwannoma is pathognomic. Um, they can initially present as unilateral vestibular schwannoma and only develop the bilateral vestibular schwannoma at a later stage. Or they could even just present with unilateral symptoms. And you scan, then you do an MRI, and then you actually find that they have got bilateral um, disease. Also to note that not all NF2 patients have bilateral vestibular schwannomas. And similarly, not all bilateral vestibular schwannoma patients have NF2 because you can have a bilateral sporadic vestibular schwannoma. Um, vestibular schwannomas can also, as we said, just be unilateral, and that's really where it starts. Um, sorry, it can also be unilateral, commonly the superior division of cranial nerve 8. Um, the schwannoma can also occur on any cranial nerve, not only cranial nerve 8. Um, and it is, furthermore, it's also possible to have NF2 without any vestibular schwannoma. If you review our diagnostic criteria, if you have two or more of the other mentioned lesions, meningiomas, gliomas, that may also be diagnostic for NF2. So you may not even have a vestibular schwannoma, you might still have NF2. The clinical signs, well, 
I think so. I think this is relatively self-explanatory. It depends on the type of lesion that they present with and where this lesion occurs. So they can present with the regular hearing loss, imbalance, and tinnitus um, for vestibular schwannoma. They can also present um, with trigeminal nerve um, palsy or fallouts uh, that may present a spatial numbness or loss of your corneal reflex. Early on in the tumors, you might have peripheral nystagmus, and as the tumors get larger, if there's brainstem compression, you could have central bidirectional nystagmus. Um, you can have other cranial nerve fallouts, as we mentioned. You can have ocular involvement if you have a meningioma, so vestibular, uh, so uh, visual acuity assessment is very important. And NF2 can have skin involvement, as we mentioned, but it is much less common. And there they can also then present with catheter layers, um, plaques, and subcutaneous lumps. What is the natural history of NF2? Well, it really depends on the genotypes and phenotypes. Um, if you have mosaic disease, as we mentioned previously, some of these vestibular schwannomas don't actually grow and you can manage them just conservatively. Whereas if you have full-blown NF2 vestibular schwannoma, they often have deafness and that can obviously be very debilitating if they develop bilateral deafness. So there's a much larger quality of life affected um, if you compare that to sporadic vestibular schwannomas where generally you have one good hearing ear. Um, Full-blown NF2 can also give you brainstem imbalances if it's brainstem involvement uh, balance problems if it's very large. Um, if it involves other nerves, you might have um, other kind of pathology like brachial plexus involvement um, and even spinal involvement with peripheral deficits. And then you can obviously have the cataracts when you have optic nerve meningiomas. Um, when we look at treatment and management for NF2, in essence. NF2 vestibular schwannoma is managed very similar to the basic principles that we apply for sporadic vestibular schwannoma. Generally, we have a more conservative approach at presentation if they're not presenting with life-threatening um, or significantly debilitating disease. But particularly in NF2, we're even more conservative than we are in sporadic vestibular schwannoma. And the reason for that is that we know that if they've got bilateral vestibular schwannomas, you really want to try and avoid very significant morbidity in attempting to treat both of these bilateral vestibular schwannomas. So in general, a conservative approach at presentation, and particularly in NF2, even more conservative than you would be in sporadic vestibular schwannomas. Historically, uh, we used to uh, go for hearing preservation, and we would just watch these tumors before we actually intervened medically. But then we were faced with the problem of really difficult removal because the tumors were larger. Um, so now there's a trend where we are a little bit more proactive and slightly earlier involvement because we have um, better treatment modalities and um, more options, which we'll cover. Um, we know that removing a smaller tumor does tend to have lower morbidity um, for rehabilitation options like um, auditory brain stem implants and cochlear implants may be nicer and easier uh, to rehabilitate these patients. Um, and if they have bilateral disease, if we are going to deal with it, then we generally deal with one um, side early on. We then try and rehabilitate that ear, and then we review to decide what we're going to do about the other ear and the other side pathology. <laughs> Treatment options are really broken up into three sections. Um, either we have surgery, which is still our mainstay option. There is a limited role for radiotherapy. And lastly, um, there, is, there are uh, medical treatments that have become available, but there are still um, quite a lot of ongoing trials regarding various drug um, agents that could be used um, for this condition. So surgery. Surgery really is still our first line for symptomatic tumors. There is a high recurrence rate, just under uh, 50%. Um, with surgery options, you can also have stereotactic radio surgery if the, if the tumors are less than three centimeters. Some institutions have access to gamma knife. Um, the success of surgery uh, with stereotactic radio surgery is not really as good as in sporadic schwannoma, but it's certainly still a very feasible option um, if patients are symptomatic. Um, our second treatment option is radiotherapy, but this is really a lot less effective and it has its own complications and long-term sequelae. We need to also remember that um, there is quite a significant uh, late malignant transformation potential if you're going to give patients radiotherapy. So you have to be really careful, especially in the younger patients. So radiotherapy is certainly in a lot more limited number of cases. And then our medical treatment options. So Avastin has um, been investigated quite extensively over the last 10 years. 
And avastin really is um, a VEGF receptor monoclonal antibody. So it binds the receptor, it inhibits the angiogenesis, and in that way, it actually inhibits the growth of the tumor. Some studies have shown that it can slow down the growth of the tumor or it can slow down the hearing loss. So the, um, some studies we, I read um, that you can actually have a reduction in tumor size in up to about 53% of patients in which it's used. Um, and you can have improved hearing in about 57% of patients. So certainly a worthwhile option. Um, the drawbacks to Avastin are that it's very expensive. Um, and there are very specific indications for the use of Avastin. Um, the general indica indications kind of internationally, this will vary from country to country, is um, growth of uh, the tumor um, four millimeters or more per year. And there has to be a functional threat. So a functional threat could be um, hearing loss or vision loss. So those would be the indications for um, giving a patient Avastin. Avastin has got side effects, nephrotoxicity, fertility, blood clotting profile, um, but usually um, some of the centers, um, especially some of the centers in Manchester have used Avastin quite extensively and they feel that um, the side effects are actually relatively well tolerated by patients that do opt for this as an option. In terms of workup for NF2, we obviously want to test the hearing and do peer tone averages, but we also need to do speech discrimination with word scores. When we have a stable schwannomas, we can have sound distortion. Um, so your peer tone average may not be an accurate reflection of what your functional hearing is doing. So it's better to test functional hearing with speech discrimination. Uh, we would do an MRI with gadolinium enhancement, a T1 and T2 imaging. Um, you'd always get ophthalmology consult. If you have a genetics team available, they are a crucial part of the team and really get early involvement of the entire NDT team. There are so many role players in NF2 um, I mean, from the dermatologist, uh, ENT, genetics, neurosurgery, neurologist, pediatrics, um, oncology, and ophthalmology, and I'm sure many other teams that aren't listed here. When we counsel patients regarding treatment options for NF2, there's a couple of kind of key nuggets that we just need to talk about. I think one of the things we need to talk about is if conservative management is going to be pursued, what that looks like. We need to tell patients that it may, they may still need surgery in the long run. And we also need to explain to them what the risks and benefits are of watchful waiting. When we counsel them, we also have to talk about realistic surgical expectations and outcomes. For vestibular schwannoma, we know that there's a relation between facial nerve injury and the size of the tumor. But there may also be other things like CSF leak, strokes, meningitis, and other cranial nerve fallouts. And we also need to tell patients that, you know, there's a higher recurrence potential than in sporadic tumors. From a surgical outcome perspective, we also need to make a decision on whether we're going to be able to do a total resection or subtotal resection. Most institutions will favor a total tumor resection, but sometimes there is a role to just take off part of the tumor, especially when you're trying to preserve something like cranial nerve 7 function. If patients have other concomitant cranial nerve or peripheral tumors, you really want to try to avoid too many cranial nerve de deficits in one patient, um, as they do have um, quite a significant psychological sequelae um, in this particular group of patients. If you're counseling parents, um, you really do need to counsel them, especially if they have autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Um, it's important for them to know um, what the chances are of. Um, transmitting NF2 um, to subsequent children. Also for parents, they need to know that children may have learning difficulties and behavioral issues and that they will be the primary um, caregivers that will need to be able to look out for those sorts of things. You need to tell patients about what the follow-up is gonna look like. Um, it's probably going to involve repeat MRIs. Um, you may need to, you will see them again to establish whether or not there's any chance of facial nerve recovery or residual function. And then obviously we always want to visit the possibility of possible rehabilitative measures, for example, um, ABI and cochlear implantation. And then lastly, we need to talk to patients about what therapeutic endpoints or measures of success are going to be. And these measures of success and therapeutic endpoints, um, when we look at studies or even just in the literature, are not that well defined. Um, in terms of hearing rehabilitation, we really have sort of two options. We have cochlear implantation as an option, auditory brainstem implantation. Um, we can do cochlear implantations in NF2 patients, um, but 
the patients that are best suited for this form of hearing rehabilitation are the ones where the tumors were actually managed conservatively. And there we can tell patients that, look, we actually, our expectation if you have a cochlear implant is around 60% um, sentence scores after CI. Um, cochlear implantation is also suited to patients that have had stereotactic radio surgery or cochlear nerve preserving surgery. Um, the expectation in this particular group is a bit less. It's around 35 to 40% um, in terms of sentence scores with the cochlear implant. So they can do well with the cochlear implant, but they don't all do well with the cochlear implant. Um, ABI can be, the ABI option can be visited when we've got had previous surgery where the cochlear nerve is not intact. It's not quite as rehabilitative as cochlear implantation, but at least it allows environmental sounds and lip reading. And then as we're approaching the end of the discussion, we just want to also cover some therapeutic endpoints. And this is also important for surveillance. So they established this kind of international collaboration to reach consensus in what trial endpoints are. And it's really, it's quite a developing um, kind of uh, developing scope. Um, some of the endpoints are looking at tumor response. So where you actually measure them on MRI. Other endpoints are what the functional or visual outcomes are, what the patient reports his outcomes are, um, the neurocognitive outcomes, and also biomarkers and whole body MRI. So it is um, quite a developing field in terms of how we should be monitoring and measuring therapeutic endpoints and how you're going to define that. It's still in the developmental phase. We have got clinical outcome assessments. For hearing, we often use a word recognition score. Um, for pain, uh, you can use a pain rating scale, which only require that above age of eight. Um, in terms of vision, we can do visual acuity assessments. If we're going to assess facial function, there's the scaled measurement of improvement in lip excursion, or abbreviated as conveniently as smile. Um, and in the future, we're likely to see neurocognitive outcome uh, therapeutic endpoints and even um, pain, patient reported pain and um, interference. Mm -hmm. So, as final thoughts, um, neurofibromatosis diseases are really can be quite debilitating. They've often got a loss of communication that can be either hearing or sight. Social isolation, um, where they actually avoid uh, large crowds, bullying at school, isolation due to the loss of communication is, is quite significant. Um, there's many studies which demonstrate that these patients have very poor body image, and they also are in physical pain, and that um, obviously adds to a psychological impact. The psychological sequelae can be quite can be very significant, so we have to provide support and support groups. An MDT um, team is crucial, especially, and this should be done in um, preferably in, in units that are specialized in these types of surgeries. And then I think we just need to remember that a successful surgical outcome to us may not always correlate with success as defined by the patients themselves. So every case needs to be a case-to-case -case basis, and counseling and support is very important. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on the chat or. Um, thanks, Louisa. That was a very nice, comprehensive presentation. Um, just, just to clarify, because I, I didn't find it that necessarily that clear. When you're talking about management options in terms of recidivist or known moves. I wouldn't group stereotactic radiotherapy under the surgical group, okay. as far as I know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't do the textbooks unless it's changed. Okay. When you talk about surgery, traditionally you're talking about your more aggressive surgical approaches, okay. so it's your trance, that your retros is more willing to look at and cost it. Okay. And they've all had pros and cons, and I won't comment there, but I'm not inside the market at all. And then, like you said, it's very much guided by patient factors like any type of tumor surgery, the age of the patients. Um, tumor factors is the tumor growing size of the tumor. So I, I remember correctly, some groups think the cystic barrier is a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. And then things like concomitant cranial nerve palsies, as well as obviously the state of civil Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then obviously what you can offer in your institution. Yeah. This is very specialized surgery. I think that we have that many lateral skull based surgeons inside. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
So it's not something that they have to do, have experience to do in their neighborhood and serve by their mentality. Okay. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions or comments on the chat function. Um, if there's no more questions or comments, then maybe we can end the meeting. And I think we have another meeting on Friday. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we're going to end the meeting there.